Earlier, you touched on quality of food when we were talking about night shift workers and getting more protein, but let's talk about timing of food and timing of exercise yeah. and how those impact the clock. So exercise can be useful in reinforcing um, the light signal. Um, light is the most important, but, but certainly uh, combining a run in the morning, for example, morning light exposure with exercise seems to be a stronger cue for the regulation of the clock. It's not absolutely clear, and some of the data suggests that exercise is is not a, a, a useful cue in humans. We know it is in mice and hamsters, where it's been studied extensively. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure that there will be a role of of of, of exercise, and I think going for the morning run, uh, where you're getting both natural light and exercise at the same time, is probably the the, the most useful. Food is really important. Now, we talked about light setting the master clock and then the master clock coordinating the rhythmic activity of all the, the peripheral clocks. The, you know, every cell in the body has the potential to, to generate a circadian rhythm. And so, so the, the master clock is regulating uh, billions of individual cellular clocks in the organ systems of the body. However, you can uncouple them. Classic experiments in rats, which are nocturnal, so you are only allowed the rat to have access to food for two hours in the middle of the day when it would normally be asleep. They're under a light-dark cycle, the SCN, the master clock, ticked away and was not perturbed at all by that food restriction. However, the clocks of the liver, the gut and muscles moved and aligned themselves to the availability of food. So under certain critical um, circumstances, we know that um, the peripheral clocks can be independently regulated by food. Now, that makes sense short term, because after all, if you don't food eat, you're going to die. So you don't want a completely rigid circadian architecture uh, where, where environmental conditions um, you know, uh, impact upon you, you need to have the flexibility to, to have that, that response. And that's a classic example. We know that in humans, again, that food can also shift, um, peripheral clocks. So, uh, so there is evidence. So, so when should we eat? And this is also interesting. Um, I think there's broad consensus about this now. If you look at the historical records, in 1100, um, most the the major meal of the day was breakfast time, uh, with a light lunch and and a, and a small supper. By the Tudor period, so 1500s or so, um, the main meal of the day has shifted to 11, 12 o'clock, so sort of lunch time. Then industrialization came along, and individuals' uh, workplaces and where they lived became radically and increasingly separated. So many of us now don't have time for breakfast because we're rushing to commute to get to, to work. We may have a sandwich at uh, our, um, for lunch, and then we get home finally at an, end of, at an extended day, zap a whole bunch of stuff into the microwave, and have a massive uh, um uh, uh, intake of food. Why is that bad? Well, it looks as though our bodies are still adapted to eating much earlier. If you uh, give the same meal uh, first thing in the morning or before bed, then the levels of, bl of, of blood glucose are completely different. You, you know, the, the glucose is rapidly um, metabolized and used during the first, you know, if it's, if it's taken in the morning. At night, it hangs around for much longer, and that glucose is, is going to be turned into stored uh, calories, either glycogen in the liver or fat. Um, so it's really important to appreciate, and we can go back to exercise actually in a moment, because um, when we're asleep, we're mobilizing um, calories to stay alive. Um, we're burning up stored calories. During the day, the default is to burn up the calories we take in. So metabolism is completely different when we sleep 
versus when we're awake. And so uh, the recommendation is to calorie load, breakfast, lunch, light supper, and not what most of us do, which is calorie load uh, late into the evening. And that also comes brings us back to exercise. So when should you exercise for the maximum calorie burn? Well, it depends. Um, if you exercise before breakfast, you're still on the sleep metabolic um, 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 status. So essentially, you're burning up stored calories. So if you're a morning person, then exercise first thing in the morning before breakfast means you're going to burn up more stored, uh, stored calories. So that might be a good strategy for, for what you want to achieve. However, the level of exercise, both duration and power, gets better as you go through the day. So if you want to exercise for longer and more vigorously, that occurs later in the day when core body temperature is higher. So uh, if you're a late person, then it may be easier to exercise later in the day, not too close to bedtime, uh, and then you'll be able to exercise for longer, more powerfully, and therefore burn more of the calories you've taken in during the day and prevent them becoming turned into stored calories uh, as in the form of glycogen and fat. So there's a there's a uh, there's also not only an eating issue uh, but also a, an exercise issue there relating to our circadian regulation of metabolism. When you were talking about breakfast there and as a whole how we're rushing out the door and you know not having a great breakfast a lot of the time it gets me thinking about intermittent fasting which is such a popular thing now in the health and wellness space and there is some newer research of people skipping dinner and having their meals more condensed in the earlier part of the day yes but traditionally most people at least since i've been into intermittent fasting in the last number of years skipping breakfast that seems like the more common thing probably because of the social aspect of skipping dinner. That's a meal that the family often comes together at the end of the day and bonds and has food together. But what I'm getting at here is it's interesting to think of all these people, myself included at this point, I, I intermittent fast, typically skip breakfast and have my, my meals later in the day, how that relates to this whole circadian clock. Well, on the basis of the data, uh, you know, those glucose studies, it would make a lot more sense. And, and of course, the historical documents, when you say traditionally, well, actually, no, traditionally, we ate breakfast, lunchtime. You know, my grandparents, you know, my grandfather would come home uh, for lunch and have a sizable lunch. The French still have their main, you know, big lunch um, and a smaller, smaller dinner. So actually, the eating later is a, is a more recent phenomenon. And on the basis of the data, uh, of the circadian regulation of metabolism, it would seem to me, and I'm very happy to be corrected, um, uh, uh, better to front load your calories rather than back load your calories. Are you familiar with any of the newer research that I was referring to where science is showing that it's better to have the calories earlier in the day? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's it, that's uh, that's consistently, I mean, uh, a whole bunch of different labs around the world have shown that first, you know, having your calories earlier rather than later is better, certainly for glucose metabolism, very, very clearly. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. So the shorthand for melatonin that you read all the time is that it's a sleep hormone and it most emphatically is not. But what does caffeine do? Well, it blocks adenosine receptors within the brain. So it masks...